we're really honored to have Greg Treverton uh, join us uh, today, executive advisor. He served in numerous distinguished roles in, in national security in the US, and he was formerly uh, the chairman of the National Intelligence Committee just during the Obama administration. <laughs> Uh, at RAND and, uh, and then also just many other positions. So uh, Greg recently published a paper on our website in which uh, he offers some, I think, pretty provocative suggestions uh, about the reordering of world power and perhaps even the future of democracy. And so Nicole, if you could please put a link um, in the chat window if, uh, that takes folks to the paper, it'd be great. It's actually a short read, but it uh, certainly is, uh, we'll, we'll start you kind of questioning some of the fundamental tenets that we've had for the last, at least the last 20 years, if not since the, the fall of the Soviet Union. So Greg, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, AJ. It's a, uh, I would say except for the subject is a dreary one. It's a, it's a pleasure and to be with SMA folks. So I, I look forward to the next half hour. It may seem a little cold hearted to talk about the international future when brave Ukrainians are dying. And I also feel sorry for all those poor Russian conscripts who have no clue why they're fighting and dying. So, mm -hmm. But since this uh, war took us very much by surprise, it was something that I think none of us thought would happen, particularly not in Europe. That's a little ethnocentric to say it that way, but uh, none of us thought it would happen. So we need, I think, to think about the future. So let me just say a few words about the current circumstance and then move toward thinking about possible futures. The most obvious thing I think to say about this war is it's very unlikely that there can be any clean ending to it. Even if uh, Putin did what we hoped he would do and still might do, that is declare victory and withdraw most of his troops, that would still leave Russia as a pariah state. It would leave Putin as a accused war criminal and it would probably leave all the sanctions in place. Uh, what hmm. looks like we're happening now is we're settling into, so I put it, the, the Russians are no longer losing, but they're not exactly winning either. Hmm. Uh, this looks like it could settle into a kind of a long war of attrition, a slightly bigger version of what we saw after 2014 for the last eight years. And that's a, that's a pretty ugly outcome. It seems to me in that circumstance, there are really two risks of escalation. One is one we thought a lot about, and that is given Putin's health, uncertainty about whether he's got cancer or not, the chances that he might feel like if he's going down, he's going to do something dramatic, like use a nuclear weapon, even though there's no possible military use for a nuclear weapon in the Ukrainian conflict. That's obviously one big, big mm -hmm. worry. The other thing is, is really more on the Ukrainian side. Uh, NATO and the United States have supplied Ukraine with ever more accurate and long range weapons. And while whatever the Ukrainians say, it's gotta be tempting for them at some point to say, we're gonna use these weapons against targets that are bothering us in Russia proper. So that's an escalatory uh, trail that I think we ought to be concerned about it and worry about. In the end, I suppose the, it'll come down sadly to what the Ukrainians think. At some point they may decide, their leaders may decide that uh, uh, this is just too much suffering that they just can't continue. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that my former colleagues in intelligence now are saying, in some ways, they feel like they understand Russia better than they understand Ukraine, and what, what Ukraine is interested in its strategic objectives. Uh, people have begun to talk, Henry Kissinger and Emmanuel Macron of France mm -hmm. have, been, have begun to talk about some sort of deal. You can imagine at some point the Ukrainians might decide they just had enough and affect agree to some sort of ugly truce, which would leave Russia occupying big chunks of Ukraine. That I think is in the end up to the Ukrainians, but we need to be careful because it isn't, there is the chance of a wider war and therefore we need to, to be uh, I think attentive to mm. and working with the Ukrainians. If we imagine the current circumstance continuing, then the economic effects are gonna be enormous. We've already seen the OECD and the World Bank say that uh, this is gonna, uh, have a big effect on the global economy. The most immediate and dire effect is probably on grain mm -hmm. and probably on Africa, since the Africans import something like half their grain from Ukraine and Russia. Uh, and to the extent that's slowed and complicated circumstance, uh, Putin says that he's willing to make sure that uh, ships can leave with grain. He says correctly that it was the Ukrainians that first mined the area outside Odessa to keep the Russians out. What, what the Russians have done since I think is less clear to me, but obviously getting grain 
out and getting it especially to Africa is a first priority. The other big issue plainly is oil. And we've seen that uh, mm -hmm. so not only has the price risen dramatically, yeah. but Russia's revenues have, from oil have also oh. gone up. That's taken the ruble up, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. uh, they've also had a pretty clever um, exchange controls done by a pretty clever central banker. So they've uh, managed to hold the ruble up despite all. The big uh, uh, question, I think, as we move forward, if we imagine the stalemate continuing, is will the impressive coalition that the United States has put together hold? Will it continue to hold? Will the Europeans actually make good on their on their promise to, to import much less Russian oil, uh, despite the, the pain that will cause? So that's, uh, I think, the, the, the big issue going forward. It's also hinged by what happens in the United States. We're now close to elections. Mm -hmm. The next couple of years will be a, a big issue for us. And whether the United States can continue to exercise the kind of leadership it has will be, I think, a, a, a very big question. It's also worth noting, as lots of people have, that the coalition so far is mostly close allies of the United States, Europeans and a couple of Asians that a lot of what we used to call the third world has basically sat this one out. Uh, most of Africa, India, and others, uh, they haven't been part of the coalition. Uh, China obviously is not. China, is, we'll talk more about China later, but <clears throat> China has uh, said belatedly the right things about the conflict, but hasn't done anything more than that. And is obviously benefiting from the, uh, the windfall of, of Russian oil. If we think about the uh, geopolitical and geoeconomic effects, um, Maybe the economics is most interesting first. And that is in the short run, the United States and the coalition need to put pressure on frenemies like Saudi Arabia, maybe even Venezuela hmm. to pump more oil. There's no excuse, there's no alternative really, but to have more oil on the short run. So that's an uncomfortable. We see Mr. Biden going to Saudi Arabia, sort of hat in hand, uh, which is not, not great, but uh, probably necessary. Uh, the other interesting thing, more longer term, I think is as the countries uh, accelerate their efforts to move away from fossil fuels uh, toward renewables, that's going to uh, create some interesting winners. I mean, it turns out, for instance, that the Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, has a lot of lithium and rare earths, right? Uh, and so it will be a great winner as we move toward solar or other forms of power that require batteries. Yeah. Right. So those will be, uh, that'll be a big deal. Interesting to imagine that. Congo becoming a winner. Uh, it's also, China is also uh, a winner in this sense because it uh, yeah. is a, a pretty dominant rare earth materials. Uh, I worked on rare earths uh, 15 years ago for RAND. And I discovered that they're misnamed. They're not rare. Uh, they're just in diluted quantities, many places, so that mining them is an ecological disaster. Uh, huh. I suppose diluted earths is not such a good phrase, <laughs> phrase as rare earths. <laughs> More generally, I think of this as the last couple of years as really the third inflection point in the last 50 years in international politics. The other two were the end of communism and the fall of the Soviet Union and 9-11. Mm -hmm. Those came with sort of clear instructions. The instructions weren't entirely right, but they weren't entirely wrong. That's what we're living through. We don't know exactly what this inflection point is going to be, but it's plain we're living through it. I would have said before the war in Ukraine, that we were moving toward a world of not exactly of blocks, but more of clubs. Mm -hmm. One club around China and one club around the United States with countries moving back and forth, sitting on the fence. You could see that in the European attitude toward 5G. Mm -hmm. you know, on the one hand, they took American worries about security. On the other hand, the United States didn't really make much of an offer, didn't have much to offer, and uh, Huawei was attractive on economic grounds. Yeah. And so they were, they were very much torn. So the question I think is, how does this war, how is this war going to change, if at all, that future vision of the world? Will it create a kind of uh, Russia-China autocratic block? I guess I'm skeptical, but, but we'll find out. I'm skeptical because it seems to me any, any tighter alliance between China and Russia would be one of which Russia was the junior partner. And that doesn't seem any part of Vladimir Putin's imaginings for Russia's future, but still we'll find out. Hmm. Uh, I'm skeptical that, that so far 
We'll talk more about China later, but China's in an awkward position. Uh, because on the one hand, they want to support their friend. On the other hand, their friend is doing exactly what 50 years of Chinese history has said can't do, right? Non-intervention, sovereignty, those have been themes of the Communist Party in China forever. So it's got to be sort of uncomfortable. I also think it's uncomfortable in the sense that uh, there's, the world has made a kind of symmetry between Taiwan and Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. in yeah. fact, we know the situation that, that China's claim to Taiwan is much stronger than <laughs> Russia's to Ukraine. And so that's got to be a bit uncomfortable as well. Uh, so I'm skeptical of any tighter bond, mm -hmm. but we will see. The final, for me, the big geopolitical question is really the future of Russia. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I was on a panel with uh, Gary Kasparov mm -hmm. just in New York a couple of weeks ago, and he's been um, pretty, pretty prescient about, uh, about Putin. Uh, he was much more optimistic than I would be that this would be the end of Putin. Basically, he thought that Putin couldn't ever make peace, mm -hmm. uh, that it would take somebody else, another Russian leader, to, to make peace. Neither of us had a good mechanism how that was going to happen. Uh, I, having lived through the uh, fall of the Soviet Union, I suppose I'm skeptical that bottom-up protest is going to make a change in Russia. So hmm. if I had to bet, and I wouldn't bet a lot, if I had to bet, I'd bet on the military. Uh, and Gary Kasparov would bet on the people. Yeah, well, he might bet on the people. He probably, <laughs> yeah. He's probably more likely to bet on the people. Yeah. I think the military, the Russian military, has got to hate this. Uh, yeah. you know, they're chewing up soldiers and material that they can't easily replace uh, for a war that my guess is many of them don't understand much better than mm. those poor conscripts uh, so so we'll see mm. i um so i wouldn't bet the ranch but if i had to make a bet i would bet i think on, on the military mm. uh, last comment is really um when i was releasing global trends at the national right. intelligence council in 2017 uh, carl built the mm -hmm. swedish statesman and prime minister did me the honor of coming to the inaugural ceremony. At dinner afterwards, I said to Carl, I said, uh, how long do you think it'll be before we worry because Russia's too weak, not too strong? He said about 10 years. Uh, as far as I can tell, uh, Mr. Putin is hastening that timetable for Russia's uh, weekend. Let me stop there. All right. Well, thank, thank you so much, uh, uh, Greg, and some really interesting ideas there and, and uh, the number of questions which you've posed, actually, which I guess only time will perhaps uh, uh, give us the answers to those questions. We actually had a chance once we've announced uh, the town hall, we have a lot of questions that came in. <laughs> and so I'm going to try to work our way through many of those sure, questions. Sure. Um, questions kind of come in a number of different flavors around kind of near-term military outcomes, around uh, economic sanctions, uh, and then a kind of around the future of geopolitics, world order, those sorts of things. So uh, also, if you have questions, let's put them in the chat. If we can't get to those questions, we'll try to do that in another town hall. Um, all right, and, so let's- And Greg can write another paper. And he can write another paper, yes. All right, so let's go it, ahead it, and get started. Uh-huh, uh, yes. The camera's moved uh, off frame, so if we could move it back towards AJ a bit, because okay. you're cut out of the picture. Okay. more. How's that? Not more. There we go. We're good now. Okay. Now you got both. Sorry. Thank you, Jacques. All right. So let's let's start with uh, an interesting question. It's you know it's clear that uh, U.S. well and other Western countries have supported Ukraine with arms. We haven't given them everything. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so I mean, thinking about kind of how this war is unraveling, has that really been a genuine choice for us in terms of, of, of not giving them everything? Do you see that that wherever we put that line, moving it on. I think the line has moved. The, uh, the strategy, I think, has been the only one we could do, which is really to support the Ukrainians as much as we could, but avoid those things that would be clearly escalatory. Mm -hmm. uh, bit by bit, we have escalated because they yeah. wanted more, they needed more. Uh, but I think that basic, that basic premise is the right one. You know, whether it works in the end, who knows? Some, some, the other school would say, well, as long as you're helping them kill Russians, you might as well help them kill Russians better, right? Uh, so um, I, I think it's, it's, it is a danger. I do worry about escalation. Uh, the intelligence sharing piece has mm -hmm. been really very interesting. You know, it's easier because so much of the intelligence we share is imagery. 
which right. is mostly not classified. You can get it from Google or buy it. You buy commercially. <laughs> buy it commercially. <laughs> uh, but it has been interesting. Now, we, in some ways, my former colleagues have maybe talked a little too much about it. Hmm. Uh, I think, you know, if you've uh, wounded the bear, it's probably not a good idea to say, we set the trap, right? Yeah. That's probably not a good idea. But the intelligence sharing and the use of intelligence to mm -hmm. keep Putin on his back foot, I think it's really been, been pretty impressive. So I don't see much alternative to what we've done, which is basically try hard not to do visibly escalatory things while helping the Ukrainians hmm. as much as we can. Yeah, there seems to be kind of three areas there. One is long range weapons. Right. The other is around uh, air dominance, right? Or, or, or protecting the skies um, from the Russians uh, uh, having air dominance. And I guess the third is around uh, command and control, right? In terms of how well organized Ukrainian forces are against the Russians, where the Russians didn't seem to be early on that well organized. <laughs> no, no, they plainly hadn't. I, I, I guess, I assume they planned it was yeah. going to be easy, just like Putin thought yeah. it was going to be easy. Again. <laughs> and so they were surprised they weren't well prepared. It was really quite a disaster and, and does make you think in general it makes you think have we overestimated hmm. russian military capacity yeah. for quite a long time uh, we'll see I and mean, they've still got as one of my colleagues but recently the russians are now down but not out uh, they still mm -hmm. have a lot of military capacity despite all the things they've uh, so they've got despite the sinking of the moskva mm -hmm. and the flagship right. the black sea fleet is still a pretty impressive fleet it is. and they've got lots of other equipment so um, this is not sadly not over yeah. we'll see hmm. right let's move on to some questions around the sanctions uh, ec uh economic sanctions right and impact on economy uh you know it, it, i think it's pretty clear that the sanction on uh on the russian banks from the intercurrency um, exchanges with swift right seemed to be really the deepest blow that's been made to them and that was done early on uh there's a question about you know are there any other remaining sanctions kind of that similar caliber that um, obviously haven't considered but not yet imposed I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, I mean, obviously, oil is the biggest, yeah. biggest one, but uh, that's in train. We'll see how that plays out. But, but I, I don't uh, see big, great alternatives out there that would be. Uh, you know, we've done what we can. We've tried to take, take, get, take away the oligarchs' wealth, yeah. put mm -hmm. them under pressure. Uh, but otherwise, I don't. I don't see much mm -hmm. more that that really can be done easily. I mean, maybe can't be done at all. So um, I think we've gone about as far as we can with the sanctions, we'll, we'll see. The, the dilemma is always uh, uh, that, you know, you can't, you can't hurt the people, they can't hurt the government without hurting the people. people. And you can't uh, help the people without helping the government. So we're, uh, George Kennan said that a long time ago, and he was right. I think in the communist countries uh, are difficult. So uh, I think that we're yeah. in that dilemma. We've gone, I, I, I'm impressed at how far we've gone with uh -huh. the sanctions. You know, the Russians, sorry, the Germans came uh, further in three weeks than yeah. in the previous 30 years. So it's been, it's been pretty impressive. Hmm. So I, I don't know if you caught it in the paper just recently. I, I was uh, caught it the, in the article that uh, in Fiji, we had, uh, I guess, successfully seized one of those very large luxury yachts from one of the oligarchs. And um, so I guess uh, there's been, I, I, at one point in time, uh, there was the idea that the oligarchs themselves, they would feel this hurt, right, of the assets being seized, and then ultimately they would perhaps be a driver of change. Any any comments on that? Yeah, I thought about that too, and uh -huh. I, we've all thought about that, and maybe hope that would be true. I think that the uh, that you know that the oligarchs are so beholden on the whole to Putin. You know, he's he's had 22 years basically to try and modernize the Russian economy. He hasn't done. He hasn't yeah. done. He's basically let it stay reliant on oil and has let these oligarchs take rents from hmm. what economists call right. rents from all of, the, of that, the oil wealth. Uh, so I think they're pretty beholden to him. I, at one point, hope they might be a factor, uh, but I don't, I don't think so. I don't hmm. think so. I, uh, to follow the Soviet Union, I was betting on the kids. I thought the kids, the young people would say, the Russia's future is only with the West. I lost that bet. Um, kids either kept their heads down and made money or moved to Brighton Beach <laughs> or maybe He's Santa, well maybe enough, Santa Monica. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, or London. Lost that bet. Or yeah, London. Yeah. yeah, but especially London. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you had mentioned the uh, the strength of the Russian ruble, which was, I think, a surprise to many, now particularly given uh, the level of inflation that we've seen here in the U.S. Um, you kind of have any thoughts about uh, 
if you kind of fast forward that picture in terms of do you see the Russian ruble kind of remaining strong as as we still struggle through inflation or any 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 possibility of kind of that what appears to be a status quo right now changing? Yeah, I think it again it goes back to the oil sanction. Uh, mm -hmm. So long as the Russian revenues from oil are staying high and maybe even going up as they have in the last in the last several months, um, then it's hard to imagine the ruble going down. So it'll mm -hmm. depend, I think, on whether we actually can, whether this is the Europeans primarily, whether the Europeans actually can make good on their promise. So it's all or less oil. Yeah, and as well as in the near term, perhaps uh, OPEC and Saudi Arabia, obviously uh, increasing so, production. Yeah, we haven't, uh, they've, so far they've only been modest mm -hmm. uh, promises, we'll see. Uh, but, uh, and you know, obviously something, even if we decide we're gonna try and increase production, it you know, takes some time. Those countries could do it more easily, obviously, Saudi Arabia could. So we'll see. But I, I don't expect that there'll be much a dramatic increase in production hmm. on the production side. And, and a lot of whether uh, the Europeans actually can make good on their mm -hmm. promise to cut back on Interesting. So I, I guess it's a big chess game, as Gary Kasparov would say, <laughs> yeah, around, yeah. around the price of the barrel and then that level of production and what the Russians can do or not do as well as the levels of consumption. Hey, Jay, can I just ask one yes. question? So why do you, why hasn't OPEC stepped up? They would have the opportunity, just like the Russians, to benefit from a perceived oil shortage. But they also benefit from high prices. Right? I, yes. So, yes. So, so, <laughs> so oh, they're, they're that, yeah. Blind yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and Saudi Arabia is particularly keen on, as they privatized uh, Aramco, right. um, yeah. to, to yeah. see that a, a big success for them. So it is a big chess game. <laughs> it is a big chess game. <laughs> it's yeah. a long-term chess game. As so, we see at our, our yeah. gas stations, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, we, we're all feeling the pocket, for sure. So you mentioned about Putin's health, uh, I guess reportedly he's been receiving some cancer treatment. Um, and I guess there's been a lot of speculation about his future health and a potential replacement. Um, any thoughts about uh, if there were a replacement for Putin, uh, you know, kind of what would drive that individual to de-escalate or, or perhaps even escalate? Yeah, yeah. Well, we looked at this question uh, when I was at the National Intelligence mm -hmm. Council. Uh, we happily concluded that uh, most successors to Putin would be Putin light, Putin like Putin, uh, and I think <laughs> okay. that's still probably true. But if the circumstances got to the yeah. point where that leader had to end the war, mm -hmm. that might set in motion a, a very interesting dynamic. I mean, so far Putin has kept really good control of the narrative inside Russia, yeah. but that's bound to change over time as bodies come, as cell phones get. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that um, I think that will change. And again, for the bottom-up protest matters much, but that certainly will affect, it seems to me, attitudes of, hmm. of the military, especially, but also Russia more generally. So it is conceivable, I suppose. I don't think we're likely to get a reformer, uh, but uh, the successor to Putin might be different and conceivably maybe even say, you know, this is not the, not the right path for Russia. Uh, it's interesting that, that Putin has basically made his own pivot toward mm -hmm. Europe away from the Far East, mm -hmm. uh, and that seems to me in the long run a very dangerous dangerous move for for the Russians. Why is that? Well, yeah. I've, I've always thought, uh, this is crude, I'm, I put it this way, I've always thought that, that uh, the Far East was sort of ripe for what I think of as the North American solution. That is all these, uh, uh, in the North American case, all these white settlers moving into uh, lightly populated and lightly defended areas in the West. Uh, and uh, in this case, it's the Chinese looking at the Russian Far East. Already there, by some estimates, 300,000 Chinese living on Russian territory in the Far East. And uh, Russia's effort, Putin's effort to try and move settlers, get hmm. people to settle in the Far East has failed. And so in the long run, that demographic pressure, it seems to me, is, is almost irresistible and works very much against Russia's hmm. interest. Hmm. So I think it's the modern day version of homesteading and pioneering, isn't yeah, it? Well, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, that's, uh, so everyone loves labels, right? So uh, obviously everyone knows the label new, uh, the Cold War. Do you by any chance have a label for whatever we want to call this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I, I need to work on that. I, think, I, I, I dislike the, the term Cold War particularly is applied to, to the United States and China. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. the, the cold this is very different from that war. You know, in that in that period, 
the United States and the Soviet Union had almost no economic connection at all. A little bit of grain, mm -hmm. remember the mm -hmm. grain embargo in 1979. Um, but otherwise, you know, they, we were, Soviet Union was a trivial trading partner for mm -hmm. the United States, not true in China. We are, you know, now we're bound, whether we like it or not, there's a kind of mutual assured yeah. destruction uh, economic. economic terms, yeah. right? Well, we could destroy their economy and they could destroy ours, yeah. but that would be pretty stupid. So I think keeping that in mind, that isn't going to change. The, all the talk of reshoring, mm -hmm. changing supply, well, it's just going to have an effect, but not a dramatic effect. So that's going to continue. And also the other thing we did reasonably well with the Soviet Union, we have to, was avoid a nuclear war that would have been bad for everybody. <laughs> with China, it's the climate crisis. So doing something about that is imperative. And that means hmm. we've got to work with China, whether we like it or not. So that makes me, it makes me think that the term Cold War is not quite right. But I need to come up with something better. That's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if I were in the advertising business, I'd probably done it already. But <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we need to commission someone on Madison Avenue to help us with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, you mentioned China, right? And so, uh, you know, we've talked about this before. It certainly has been uh, talked about in many papers about uh, at what point would China perhaps even use uh, what Putin has done as the trigger point for them to resolve the, um, the, the Taiwan issue. Yeah, I'm worried about that. As I said uh, earlier, I now worry somewhat less about it because it seems to me this is sort of uncom this is uncomfortable, doubly uncomfortable for Xi Jinping, mm -hmm. uh, uh, having his friend do all these things that they've opposed forever. And this uh, funny symmetry between Taiwan and Ukraine, which isn't really symmetry, but I think it's, it's sort of put lots of world attention on Taiwan. So rather than uh, rather than being an opportunity for the world is distracted, now it seems to me there's quite a lot of attention. So this seems to me, I imagine that uh, President Xi is, is uncomfortable. So far, he's not been uncomfortable enough to do much of anything. They've, said the right things more or less but we hoped at one point he might be a kind of a mediator or a moderating hmm. influence on putin hmm. no evidence of that so far hmm. so it's still a worry other than perhaps them continuing with their with their strategy to uh continue to assert their rights in the, in the china sea yeah yeah, yeah. So, no, they do that. so uh let's talk about about uh india and israel right <laughs> yeah. so let's talk about india first right <laughs> So, you know, clearly they've benefited from discounted oil prices uh, from Russia. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any obvious incentive for them to, to kind of change their stance today. Uh, is, there, is there, do you see that changing at all? And is there something which the West can do that could perhaps um, motivate them to? Yeah, I don't, um, unfortunately. One hope people had was that this would uh, be an opportunity to sort of expand the democratic block coalition yeah. uh, and it has to some extent but not not to a huge extent uh, it seems to me india's interests probably are served by enjoying the windfall of lots of cheaper energy and continuing their military arms relationship with russia russia yeah uh, there doesn't seem much cost to it from my perspective uh, that makes me skeptical that it will change so other than them being the world's largest democracy that as a fundamental tenant in terms of driving their national security doesn't seem to to, to play a role here it doesn't yeah. seem to it doesn't seem to run there now and they've moved in a more hindu nationalist direction as well so their politics is is moving in some shall we say directions we wouldn't necessarily prefer right? yeah. they're not not necessarily undemocratic but they're certainly yeah. less democratic how about israel <laughs> yeah, a, thoughts on I, Israel. I suppose Israel will always do what it wants to do. I, I'm I'm surprised you think that it would it would want to be on side. It doesn't have all that much. It seems to me to gain by uh, staying yeah. close to to Russia. Uh, it's obviously hedging its bets in a general way, but that is a surprise. I would think that they uh, would want to emphasize their democracy, their democratic character, mm -hmm. uh, and would have been much more on side. But they also it seems to me probably stand to benefit to, uh, as we do from the drain of tech talent that's leaving Russia. So mm -hmm. in that sense, that seems to be able to welcome that. Uh, that's probably not a reason to, to turn against Russia, but I'm, I am surprised by that. Mm -hmm. uh, you would have thought they'd want to make clear I, they were in the coalition. I think a lot of people have scratched their heads trying to figure out Russia, uh, Israel and India, both, both of those countries, absolutely. right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think we could add Brazil to that same <laughs> yes. club. Yes. <laughs> so uh, since we'll stay in the region there, right? So. Um, 
it seems that the uh, perhaps both world, but particularly European response to Russia's involvement in Syria is very different than the response in Ukraine. Any any thoughts about kind of what what fundamentally is different between the two? Well, I think when I used to uh, think about the uh, Middle East uh, when I was at the National Intelligence Council, uh, I would think that the Middle East was, in technical terms, a mess. Hmm. Uh, and um, Syria was so complicated and so messy, and the sides were so mixed up uh, that, you know, it, Ukraine's different. Ukraine looks like and is yeah. pretty naked aggression against an right. independent country. And Syria was such a complicated mix of Assad yeah. and the opposition and terrorism uh, that it was mm -hmm. it was it was it wasn't it wasn't so easy to know which what so, the right side to uh, be on was. So so that was a technical term mess that you guys <laughs> yes, use on yes, the National yes, Intelligence yes. Uh, Committee. So <laughs> if, if Syria was a mess, how did you refer to Lebanon? <laughs> <laughs> Beyond mess. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, poor, poor Lebanon. <laughs> they have to be, feel sorry for. For it. Indeed. Since it yeah. was once the kind of the jewel of the Middle East. Yeah. A long, long way it was. That seems like another another world a yeah. long time ago. The uh the Russia is uh, you know obviously a permanent member of the UN Security Council. So you see um, I don't even know possibly if there's a mechanism through which that could change, but do you have do you see that at all changing uh, as this war continues to perhaps ostracize Putin? Yeah, I don't see that changing. It'd be uh, I suppose the most you could imagine is could you imagine a Security Council in which there wasn't a veto on some issues, right? In which nobody got to veto. Uh, that, that might be worth thinking about. I'm, in retrospect, sorry, after the fall of communism, I think the one thing we didn't do, what we could have done in the Clinton administration, which I uh, served, was really uh, pay serious attention to the UN. We could have done almost anything to the UN at that moment. We used to refer to it as Tom Pickering's UN. Tom was yeah. an ambassador. ambassador. To the UN. Yeah. I used to think of the UN as Tom Pickering's UN. Yeah. And we just uh, didn't really do it. There would have been a time to, to dramatically hmm. at least try to appreciate the UN. And I'm sorry we didn't do it. Hmm. Let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, lessons learned. And so clearly a lot of lessons learned from a military perspective, and I'm sure that there's uh, between the office and assessment and all the other planners are thinking about the future and American uh, military capabilities. Um, any particular ones that kind of stand out to you in terms of what we've observed of the Russians that could apply to how we think of, think of kind of the capabilities we need in the future? Yeah, I, uh, on the more political side, I, you know, there, there are two sets of issues people have talked about. One is, uh, is, is the chain of things we did after 1992. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, the expansion of NATO and all those things. And I think if we had that hand to play over again, we might do it somewhat differently. Hmm. What it seems to me, we've tried harder to find something that really did anchor uh, Russia in a European security range, but very difficult even if you think about playing the hand again, because those countries in Eastern Europe didn't want to be part of some Russia-centered coalition. Uh, when they had the opportunity, they wanted to be in NATO. Yeah. So that was, it would have been hard to replay that. But um, hmm. I think we might have done that, done somewhat differently if we had to do over again. Uh, the um, the other other issue is uh, on the other side. In some respects, is uh, should we have reacted uh, more vigorously to Georgia and Chechnya, yeah. things mm -hmm. that the Russians did? Uh, did we by letting them giving them sort of a pass in Georgia and a semi pass six years later? In, Crimea and uh, Ukraine, did we encourage Putin? I think that uh, doesn't certainly justify what they did, but it's, it's a question worth asking. On the military side, I think uh, so far we, we haven't, it seems we've learned, uh, learned too much. We've learned that the, the Russians aren't as good as we thought they were. Uh, and, and I guess we've learned that we all are thinking about cyber war and mm -hmm. cyber conflict that uh, good, good old fashioned kinetic war is still possible, which is <laughs> sadness. I, I think we, I would have yeah. thought we were right. well beyond this, but the idea that we have a something that looks like World War II going on in Europe in 2022 is pretty, pretty yeah. uh, cautionary. Yeah. I think perhaps in addition, a reinforcement of what uh, what the defense department's already focused on around kind of operate through 5G networks, those sorts of things. Because uh, I think one of the things that we perhaps learned is that the, the ability to communicate through uh, those environments in protective ways was incredibly important. It was used to Ukraine's advantage uh, early on. Um, 
Let's talk a little bit about some of the more interesting countries around Ukraine, Moldova, the Baltic countries, Finland, even. Any any thoughts about kind of, you know, what's the calculus going through their heads today? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's fascinating. I would have, uh, I've spent a lot of time, uh, I've been a fellow in Sweden for the last 10 years mm -hmm. off and on, and, and I would have thought that the, the Swedes and Finns never would join NATO. They'd always talk about it, but never do it. And now it looks like they're going to do it, which is is a pretty mm. dramatic change. So that's that's they're going in that direction. The other countries, I think, the Moldovas and others, they they must feel like they're kind of imminent danger, and some of them maybe not Belarus may not much mind it. Right. Uh, and so uh, it's very different. On the one hand, some of the close-in countries uh, are coming more under Russia's shadow, but. Uh, Change in the Baltics is, is really pretty dramatic. I, mean, I, I never would have, I would have bet against <laughs> Sweden and Finland ever joining NATO. But uh, so it's it's a it's a big change for them, a big change in their politics for sure. Indeed. So Estonia is kind of was a little bit of the playground for the Russians in terms of practicing cyber attacks. Right, right. right. <laughs> and then you know there may be other countries as well, right? Uh, but they've got to be in particularly uncomfortable situations right now, trying to sort out how they think about the future. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Estonia has been has probably gone further than any countries in yeah. trying to to uh, prepare itself for the kind of gray zone mm -hmm. warfare, cyber, uh, social media aided uh, propaganda that the Russians have been doing. They've uh, in general, I think that they, the Scandinavians and the Europeans more generally, have done much better than we have. The Swedes have, have created something called the uh, Psychological Defense Agency uh, as a separate agency. Uh, so we're, and we're pretty, pretty far from that. Uh, um, it's, it's a good thing. So they, 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 they take that the, the threat of huh. hybrid gray zone. Psychops. So, yeah. yeah, very seriously. So uh, I know we've run over time. Uh, perhaps one last question. Okay. Uh, and um, so um, I think uh, you certainly have noted in the past in your own previous papers, as well as others, uh, particularly from the intelligence community around kind of maybe from a retrospective perspective, we've actually as an issue been fairly bad at predicting <laughs> predictive future. <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, everyone was perhaps uh, very optimistically assuming after uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, that uh, the rise of the people right, in Russia would actually drive Russia towards a much more of a Western philosophy, um, but not necessarily uh, one adopting democracy, but a more of a, a philosophy that be aligned towards um, towards the West way, the Western way of thinking about things. Um, so, uh, why you know? You know why is the Russian system so impervious to change? It seems to be three groups there: the the political, the, the folks that hold the political power, the military, as I mentioned, and then kind of the people, right? And so it sounds like you're betting on the military to perhaps as the as the agent of change. Is, is that maybe we missed it? We thought it, you know, if Yeltsin, we thought it was going to be the people. Right. right. Uh, mm -hmm. They weren't able to impact change in any meaningful way. Uh, doesn't seem like the political system is at all motivated towards um, even if there's a successor. You said Putin light. You think the military might actually be a, a trigger here? Well, I think it, if, if uh, as I said, if, uh, yeah. if I had to bet, uh -huh. I would bet the military would be the trigger for some change in the short run. Whether the military can affect a wider change in Russia, that's a much bigger question. And I think we're all puzzled, as I said earlier. I, I was betting on the kids in 1992, <laughs> right. uh, but that turned out to be a, a bet I lost. Uh, so it is hard to see, it seems to me. And that, that does suggest for me that that Russia will continue to be a failing state yeah. hmm. and more and more failed one as the world, in some ways the war is accelerating in the long run, accelerating our move away from fossil fuels. So that's gonna be a big effect on Russia over time. And I think in that sense, the war has hastened that in the short run, obviously yeah. we need more oil, but in the longer run, people are gonna move away from it even more quickly than before. So uh, it's hard for me to see a, a very bright, future for Russia, uh, given, as you say, given the political stalemate, uh, the absence of obvious conditions for change. Uh, a, a very microcosm of that could be Pakistan. I mean, without the, the economic, right, in terms of kind of that interesting dynamic between mm -hmm. politics, the military, and the people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And not a very encouraging one. Right, but, exactly. <laughs> right. So in, so in some ways, uh, the fact that things haven't turned out worse Pakistan yeah. that I have is is a great surprise. Yeah. Happy surprise. <laughs> <laughs> because if you look at all the variables, it's it's uh, they're all terrible. 
Well, thank you so much, Greg. Very informative. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and the generosity of your time with us. It's been wonderful. Well, my pleasure. Thank you. We'd love thank to have you, you back again. Well, 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 and you surely can. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. <laughs>